Okay, so chapter six, uh, returning risks from investing. So asset valuation is going to be a big part of your project. And in a lot of the chapters moving forward, we're going to talk a lot about asset, uh, asset valuation, specifically stock valuation. How do, you, how do you value a stock and how do you figure out what the stock price should really be? So this way you know whether or not to buy a stock is a good investment. So a lot of the class is going to be focused on this. And it's the center of securities analysis. So security analysis is really about finding the correct value for the stock. It would be the same thing as if you were to buy uh, a business and you want to figure out what is the correct price you should pay for a business. So if you were going to buy, say you are going to buy a pizza shop, okay, and they told you the price was $5 million, would you just buy it or would you do some analysis on it? Well, what are the sales? What are the profits? How many locations do you have? What are the demographics of the locations you're living in? Are they expanding or contracting? You know, uh, what are the ex you know, uh, regulations of the industry in the local towns? And you know, how is demand for pizza changing? Are more people wanting burritos and Chinese food and less pizza? I mean, these are all things you should look into. The future prospects for the company, how they're currently doing, and come up with a valuation for what you pay for the business. And plenty of people without college degrees in finance do this every day. They buy businesses, small businesses, maybe a liquor store, a laundromat, a deli, a, a pizza shop, an ice, um, or a, a big one lately that's on the decline but was a huge swing for a while was these frozen yogurt with topping places where you would go and you say, okay, let me get the frozen yogurt and you put the toppings on it and the first time you go they say, okay, it's $12. And you're like, what? And the next time you go, you take a little of ice cream and maybe two gum drops, and then that's what you get because you know it's being, now you figured out that they measure it by the ounces. And they actually have, um, red mango is a popular one around here. And so we've all had this experience. And then what they found out in a lot of these frozen yogurt places is that a lot of people with families don't come back because the, the parents have an idea of understanding that it's being, you're paying for the weight of the ice cream, but the kids don't. So they make these huge ice creams and then parents are like, I'm not spending $40 to go get soft serve ice cream. Here's two pints of Ben & Jerry's from Pathmar for $6. Just as good. So these are things you have to take into account. Crazy thought patterns like that when you're thinking about valuing a business. So before you bought a frozen yogurt shop, you should be thinking like this. What are the, how do the customers feel about this? What are the, is this a fad or is this going to be a big thing in the future? So this is, that's at the buying a small business level. But everything you think about at buying at the small business level is the same thing as you would think about at buying a stock because it's really represented buying a company at the big business level. So um, how should we look at the realized returns and the risks uh, associated with these companies? So I had just mentioned a bunch, a bunch of ideas of risk of, of our small businesses, but biz, big businesses have a whole host of risks as well, as well as potential for return. And the two have to be balanced. Before you buy any business, whether it's a stock, which is really like buying a small piece of a business, or, or, or a regular business for yourself, you, know, you have to look at what are the, the risks and the returns. For example, say you were to own and operate a Subway restaurant. How much money do you think you'll make a year from a Subway restaurant? You may only make $50,000 for running that Subway restaurant, and that's with you working there full time. So you may say, okay, there's a lot of risks involved with that and a lot of time commitment to run my own Subway restaurant. Maybe I'm better off just working and making $60,000 a year working for somebody else because it's a lot less risky and, get, you know, and a very steady cash flow, get my weekly paycheck. And that's why a lot of college graduates don't run subway locations because they have other opportunities that might be more or probably are more lucrative. But again, this is the risk of return trade-off that you're thinking about and when you make decisions on what to do with your time and your investments. And of course, it's uncertain what the future is going to hold. You have to make your best estimates and your, and your most uh, educated guesses in a lot of areas because any valuation you come up with, that doesn't mean it's true. It just means it's your best guess. Okay. So if we look at components of risk uh, and return, let's look at returns for right now. A big component of returns are periodic cash flows. So if we're talking about a small business, you want to know, you don't, if you come into a company and you want to buy a small business, you ask their net income, Right away, you're asking the wrong question. 
You don't ask what the net income is. That shows you've never bought a business before if you come in there and say, what's your net income? Because you know what? Small businesses look to minimize the net income to minimize their taxes. So the correct question to ask is, what is your cash flow? So you can look at the cash flow and get a better idea of what cash the business is generating. And that's more accurate than net profits. So anytime a business is valued, we're looking at cash flows, not net profits. Because net profits are minimized to reduce the tax burden. So, but in stocks, a lot of times we may, we may look at interest and dividends. Because uh, they pay, uh, well, interest for bonds, dividends for stocks. And this is just income return. So this is a cash flow that if you're going to value any you know, stock, and the stock is, a, say it's a $15 stock and it pays a $5 dividend, that's a no-brainer. That's something you buy right away. But you should look into, are they likely to pay the $5 every year? Is that a one-time dividend? Microsoft, I think, offered like a $3 one-time dividend, not something that's going to reoccur. So you really need to know what's the stability and the future uh, chances of those cash flows uh, reoccurring. A yield is just uh, a measure of the percentage of return that the income generates over the value of the asset. So if you had a, a dollar dividend on a $10 stock, it has a 10% yield. So, so price appreciation uh, or depreciation is another term we may call for capital gain or capital loss. And this is something that we should look at as far as a return. And this is basically how a lot of you are making money in the virtual stock market is you buy a stock stock price goes up and you sell it. That's a capital gain or you know, price appreciation. Sometimes the stock price goes down and you have capital loss, and that's unfortunate. Now, you take together the yield and the price change, and that's your total return. So when you look at the total return of a stock, you have to add whatever your capital gains are and whatever your yield is. And there's actually, when you look at total return, your return for the year is really um, a paper return because it's not a full actualized return until you actually sell the stock and you legitimize those capital gains. All right. Okay, so here there are a bunch of formulas in this presentation that we're going to reinforce next week with um, a multitude of handouts. So I'm just going to discuss the formulas today and, and their significance and next week we'll have practice um, going over the handouts and you, you working on the handouts. So total return, the yield plus the price change, here's another way of calculating it. Um, the cash flow T is the cash flow uh, during whatever period we want to measure. So it's the dividend you got for the year or two years. So it's really whatever uh, uh, interest or dividends you, you earned for whatever period you're calculating, usually a year. But you could do it in a month or a week or however, a quarter. Then we, we add to that the ending price minus the beginning price, and that will calculate our capital appreciation. So if the ending price is 15 and the beginning price is 10, we have a $5 per share capital gain. And we divide that by the beginning price of the stock or security. Uh, and that's gonna, you, could, you could summarize that as the, the cash flow plus the price change divided by the beginning position of the, of the, of the stock. And that will give us our total return. It's a very simple formula. You could probably even have developed this yourself if you were thinking closely about it. Now, so like I said, PE is the price at the end of the period. PB is the price at the beginning of the period. Uh, and PC is the change, which is uh, PE minus PB. So pretty simple stuff. This is just a classic total return. Now, in measuring return, you want to compare uh, performance over time, and maybe a dip across different securities. So, and you see that formula again below, the total return formula is there, and it's a percentage related to all the cash flows. So it's always reported as a percentage of return. And it could be negative or, or positive. Now, if you're dealing with a portfolio, then that becomes a slightly more um, complicated formula, but again, you're just sort of putting everything together and calculating a total return for your portfolio, which is something we'll talk about in a later chapter. Okay. Now, required return, we can get the required return 
formula by just calculating the total return uh, and then adding 1 to it. So we take the total return formula plus 1, we'll get the relative return. Or if we use the cash flow plus the, the ending price divided by the beginning price, will give us what's called a relative return. So while total return can be either negative or positive, uh, a, a, a return relative, which I call a relative return, solves the problem because it's always positive. And we get that by adding 1 to the total return. So even if the total return is negative 10%, um, the relative return is 90%. So we look at it more that percentile can never be negative because we're adding 1 to the return. So you could get, if you had a 10% total return, a RR would be 1.10% or 110%. So it's always positive. It's just another way of looking at returns. So instead of looking at returns as a total return, which we're mostly used to a positive or negative return. I lost 5%, I made 10%. Here, it'd be looking more like I made 110% or I lost um, down to 90% of my original investment. So it's just two sides of the same coin, really. But a lot of times, for some formulas, negative numbers can be a little screwy. So that's why we like to use this uh, relative return in, in some formulas where we don't want negative numbers appearing or occurring. And that's why we have these two formulas. Okay, so if we want to measure um, the wealth uh, created by investment rather than the change in the wealth, we could do a cumulative return over time. So a cumulative wealth index um, would be we would take 1 plus the total return for year 1 and we multiply that from the total return in year 2 and multiply that for the total return of every year there is in between. So this will give us a wealth, what we call a um, cumulative wealth index. And here we're just multiplying. So when you have the uh, relative return, which is not a negative, this is why you don't want two negatives because you've had two negative years and you multiply them as a positive that won't work in this formula. So that's why we have that, what I call a relative return, so that way we could do a cumulative wealth index so we could get the total wealth created over a period of time without any negatives involved. And that's why we have those two formulas. But here is just something that if we want to look at it in a longer format uh, over many years or many periods, it depends how you classify a period. This could be quarterly, cumulative wealth index quarterly, or monthly, or annual. Most are calculated annually. All right. So the um, N would just denote the number of periods you want to do it for. So WIO is the beginning period, and then uh, TR1 to TRN is the, ne is the decimal form of as many return periods as you want. And again, this makes more sense when I actually calculate it. When I give you um, example problems, you actually calculate it. You'll see more clearly what this is doing. But uh, a lot of mutual funds and a lot of um, other investments like to portray a return over five years, ten years, a longer time period. So you would want this wealth index for that. Okay. Now, what if you invest internationally? We have an additional wrinkle, which is currency. So international returns are going to include um, realized exchange rate returns or changes. This is not... This is not something you have to worry about if you buy a foreign stock in dollars on the American exchange. You know, if you buy Sony on the New York Stock Exchange, you don't have to worry about this. However, if you go out and buy a Canadian company on a Toronto exchange, you know, or a European company on one of their exchanges and you're paying in foreign currency, then you do have to worry about it. You know, uh, and so the foreign currency could be a powerful force. So for example, the Canadian dollar went down about 20% over the past year. So say about a year ago, the Canadian dollar, one Canadian dollar was equal one US dollar. So that made it very easy to travel to Canada. Everything was in like terms, pretty much on parity, on par. However, due to certain economic uh, changes, oil price uh, came down and the demand for the American dollar went up. So the American dollar increased and relative to the Canadian dollar, the Canadian dollar weakened. So now one Canadian dollar is only worth 80 cents US. Or one US dollar is worth $1.20 Canadian. 
Now, if I, was, if I had a position in Canada, I bought a Canadian stock, and that stock went up 20%, and the currency went down 20%, that wiped out all or most of my return. So I, you could say, hey, tell your broker, I made 20% of the stock. Where's my money? Well, when we converted your Canadian dollars back to American dollars, there wasn't any profits left because the, the conversion rate sucked it all up. And you say, well, that stinks. But it can also work in your favor. You could have a stock that maybe goes down 2%, but the currency goes up 20%. And now you have a significant return, basically more in the currency than the stock. In the best case scenario, the stock goes up 20% and the currency goes up 20%. So now you have a much bigger return than you thought. Uh, but we have a formula. If we take the, um, the relative return and you multiply it by the beginning, the ending value of the foreign currency, by the beginning value of the foreign currency and minus one, we'll get the total return uh, in domestic currency. So here, here's a quick little formula if you want to factor in. And if you're going to be someone dealing with mutual funds or managing corporate financial investments, you're going to be dealing with foreign currency. If you're someone who's going to, who have traveled from a foreign country to be here or plan to travel to a foreign country for work or business or pleasure, you're going to deal with foreign currency exchange. And the best advice I can tell you is don't exchange your currency at the airport. Go to a bank first or have uh, credit cards or, or um, debit cards that allow you to withdraw in the other, using ATMs of the other country. That way, this usually minimizes the exchange charges too. All right, so let's consider, here's actually a written example, again using the Canadian dollar. Uh, let's consider the impact of a falling dollar on U.S. investors for one year. So in 2007, Canadian stocks earned Canadian investors 10.5% on average. But the gain for uh, U.S. investors was 28.4% because of the strength of the Canadian dollar. So as generally a big factor in the strength of the Canadian dollar is commodities. So if commodities are more in demand, like oil, big export of Canada, their currency is in more demand relative to U.S. currency, and it usually strengthens. So, but for most of my life, the Canadian dollar has always been worth less than an American dollar. So it was really sort of an obscure period the last couple of years where the Canadian dollar was at parity or a little bit above the American dollar. So now it's going back to the historical norms. Um, so you can easily see this if you go to Yahoo Finance. Okay, so here uh, we could see the pairing of the major currencies, um, euro to US dollar. At uh, 113, the euro is at a pretty, pretty low c compared to the historical relationship between the euro and US dollar. Um, although the US dollar and the yen is actually that's um, pretty typical euro yen, euro, uh, euro pound. US Canadian dollar here, it's um, one uh, US dollars worth the dollar 24, dollar 25 Canadian. So it's actually a 25% decline now. And they're reciprocals of each other. So if you take, you know, the US slash Canadian dollars, you know, if you do one divided, then you get the Canadian equivalent. So they're just reciprocals of each other depending on how you divide it. Uh, if you want to look at Canadian dollar to U.S. dollar, you would see 0.75 cents. And if U.S. dollar to Canadian dollar, you see $1.25. So again, currencies fluctuate. And this is, uh, the lowest I've seen the Canadian dollar was, I think like 60, 58 cents, 60 cents, a U.S. cents for one Canadian dollar. And you can even get um, a chart if you want to look at a full year here. Maybe we want to look at, um, okay. So if you look at a full year, you really see in uh, the later part of the year, in August, the ramp up of the value of the U.S. dollar compared to the Canadian dollar. So you see that in um, here in August, uh, one Canadian dollar um, one, Canadian, uh, one U.S. dollar is worth a dollar six Canadian, and now one U.S. dollar is worth a dollar about dollar twenty-five or so. 
If, let's look at a, um, a five-year view, and we could see um, back here in 2011, it was 90, one U.S. dollar, uh, one U.S. dollar is only worth 94 cents Canadian. So you can see a real kind of upward trend. And you can use, actually, when we get into tech, technical analysis, you could see, um, you could use that for currency as, as well. And here's really the telling part where you should have bought into currency. Okay, back to the presentation. So that's a, if you want to get a history of that currency, you can go to Yahoo Finance. They have some good charts. And some investors actually trade on currency. They don't trade on stocks. They just trade on currency because it's just many currencies are just as volatile as stocks. And they have trends where currencies actually work in trends too, where they go up for long periods and come down for long periods. So currencies, a lot of traders and a lot of banks and institutional traders trade currencies, not stocks, because there's you know, an equal amount of speculation and profit making available in currencies. And for a lot of, I mean, in the United States, we, we don't worry about currency too much because we have the dominant currency of the world. But in other countries, they often hedge their home, their home currency by having dollars as well. So if you're, say, in Egypt and you're worried about the Egyptian pound, you'll have some money in dollars to protect yourself. And um, if you were European, it would have been smart a couple of years ago when the euro was really strong to save some of your money in dollars uh, and it would have been paying off today. So that way, you know, if you're in a country that has a high volatility in their currency, in some of those countries, most people keep most of their money in dollars and they don't really want to deal much with the local currency because it become, the inflation can eat away at it so fast. And in some places like, you know, Ecuador, Venezuela, Argentina, the prices aren't even written on the products because they're changed so frequently. You could go buy a loaf of bread the next day, come in the next morning, and it's double the price it was yesterday. So the prices change so fast. Some of these countries, uh, like um, Ecuador, just gives up on their currency and goes completely to dollars. And they just said, we don't have a currency anymore. We're just dollarizing our economy, like Panama, I think Costa Rica, Ecuador. They just. Uh, gave up on their local currency and just 100% deal in dollars now. Which is great for us as the US, we can just export dollars and it doesn't cost us much to make them and then we get a lot of hard, uh, precious uh, resources or metals in return. And it's, it's a fact that there are more dollars in circulation outside the United States than there are inside the United States just for these reasons of people wanting to hedge their local currencies. Okay, moving on. Let's. Um, Okay, so we, we talked about total return. I call it rel, uh, relative return, RR. The book, I think, calls it run, return relative. Uh, same thing. And the um, cumulative wealth index uh, are, you know, are useful for giving a single time period. Uh, what, um, w, or sorry, what, what about summarizing returns over several periods? And this we could use the arithmetic mean or the simple mean. And we, we already explored this in the previous chapter. You had a homework on one of the spreadsheets where you did geometric mean. And so we're going to talk. And this is stuff I know you know, but we're just, we, it has a special relevance when it comes to investments. So the simple mean is really just um, the sum of x. But, you know, maybe you have 20 years of x you're looking at. You just add those x's together, each, and then divide by n, the simplest mean or average return. But it's not always the most accurate. So that's why we have this geometric mean. Um, and, and again, we're going to use relative returns, which is 1 plus the total return. And we multiply uh, across the board to get uh, a geometric mean, which is a more realistic mean. Um, and you know, the differences are going to really look at the variability of the returns. You know, because think of, a, think of it like this way, you know, if you have an average, if you do an average, just a regular average mean, and most of the returns are in the beginning rather than the end of the, the, the spectrum, it's not going to be as accurate as a geometric mean 
Uh, but when the, the returns are actually quite similar year, year in, year out, then it makes less of a significant difference between the two mathematical formulas. But this is uh, a lot of investment companies will state the geometric mean because it's a little bit more accurate. Uh, so the arithmetic mean or the, the, the common average we use uh, does not measure the compound growth over the rate of time because it's just an average of all the returns. So it's not like you could take your initial investment, multiply it by the arithmetic um, mean and, and for each year and get like a really realistic result as far as you're trying to calculate what your return is going to grow to. Because uh, it doesn't capture, uh, capture the realized change in wealth over multiple points because it really depends on when are you getting those returns. Maybe you have a 1% return the first 10 years and then a 20% return the last five years. That's going to have a significant effect on your portfolio rather than if it was the other way around, 5% return for the five, first five years and 1% return after. So um, the geometric mean reflects more of a compound cumulative return that's for periods more than one year. And that's why mutual funds use it, and it's more accurate and more reflective of what your money actually grows to. So that, I mean, and this is just common knowledge. You've, been, you've done this in statistics and data analysis, and you, you know the difference between these two averages already. But in investments is really a good example of why, you know, uh, we want to use a geometric mean more than the arithmetic mean. So the arithmetic mean is great for um, a single period, uh, performance over a single period. Um, it's a good estimate. It's a quick to understand. Um, it could give you a good idea of what your returns may be likely in the next period. But the geometric mean is a better measure of the change in your overall wealth in your investment account or your overall wealth in the stock over multiple periods. Um, so it's what we call a compound rate of return. So if you really want to get an idea of uh, how much your money grew every year, this would be a more accurate portrayal of how much your money grew every year. Okay. Now, what about inflation? Inflation is a big concern for investment in general, the investment field in general, because inflation is a lot, is something most people ignore. When you think about your bank account, and you get your 0.25% return, or what we call 25 basis points. So one percentage of interest, we would say, is 100 basis points. So 25 basis points is a quarter percent return. So when the Federal Reserve or most bonds, they talk about basis points. And they're just, um, you could equate that to uh, 100 basis points is one point of interest. So, so 25 basis points is typically and if you have like one of the, you know, one of the banks that are just in place to, to steal money from you mostly, like Chase or Bank of America, they're probably paying 0% interest or, point, or 10 basis points or 10% of one interest percentage. Um, that's why if you go to a credit union, you usually get a better rate of return on your savings account. But at this point, the difference between point, uh, 15 basis points and 25 basis points doesn't equate to a lot of money anyway. So no one who really cares at this point. But if inflation is 2%, then saving your money in a bank account is really not getting you anywhere. Right? So you would, that's why a lot of people have taken their money out of the bank accounts and put them in mutual funds or stocks or bonds because you want a rate of return equal to or greater than inflation. Because if you say you got a 2% return on a certificate of deposit, I'm going to tell you you got no return. Because that same... You put $1,000 in and you got $1,000 and 20 out. Now, every, if you try to buy the same goods and materials, you really haven't gotten anywhere because the increased inflation has eaten away at whatever investment. You know. That's why if you're saving, say you're saving 10 years for a house and you're putting the money in a shoebox, you're really not going to get uh, to that. The purchase, you're going to keep chasing that purchase price of a house because the housing prices typically go up. So that's why you want a little help with compounding return. Now, the factor in, you know, um, the purchasing power, look at the purchasing power of investments, or we want to, you know, maybe we'll use a consumer price index as a measure of inflation. And this is a basket of goods. So they throw this basket of goods together and they say, how much 
did it cost to buy this basket of goods last year and how much does it cost this year? And the difference is the change of inflation. You know, so this year we're doing good with inflation because why? Gas prices are down, so we're paying less for home heating oil, less for oil at the gas, for gasoline at the gas station, and that's helping to re keep inflation reduced when that's factored in. So anyway, if we take our total return, and we're gonna, we're gonna, that's gonna be you know, one plus the total return divided by one plus the CPA, uh, uh, CPI, minus one will give us a return, and the uh, IA stands for inflation adjusted. So total return IA is total return inflation adjusted. And that's just a simple formula where we factor in the change in the consumer price index. So that way we could get a return as factoring in inflation. And that's a more accurate return because you always want, and that's why most, they, most financial advisors recommend that you invest in um, stocks and bonds because they typically beat inflation. Uh, treasury bills at the lower end or the shorter end of the duration may meet inflation, but at a very safe level. So if you get a 2% treasury bill or bond and inflation is 2%, at least you're not losing any money and at least your money's not at risk. So you're just maintaining your capital in a very safe way. But if you want to really grow, have a growth for retirement, then you may want to invest in stocks because they'll have, they, over the past 200 years, stocks have hand easy, easily, even measuring in 20 year increments, has always beaten inflation and kept your money growing ahead of inflation. And that's what you really want to make sure you, your retirement is going to help um, fund you at the inflation rates, the price rates, uh, whenever you retire. Because if you're going to retire in 40 years, gasoline could be $10 a gallon, rent could be you know, $3,600, to go to the movies could be uh, $32, popcorn be, you know, $12. So you're going to need your money to grow as fast as um, the inflation rate. Oh, and college tuition will probably be $200,000 a year if it grows at the current 14% rate. So you're going to need all the money you can get. So you don't want inflation to steal that. Now, let's take a break from these formulas for a minute because, no, I agree, talking about formulas on PowerPoint slides isn't the best way of doing it, but I just want to cover the concept and the formulas and then when you work on the, um, the class handouts, then we'll see the effect and we'll get a better appreciation for calculating and the, and the usefulness of these formulas. But let's talk about some sources of risk. Okay, so we have interest rate risk, which um, we see now that the Federal Reserve is thinking about increasing interest rates possibly in the future. And that's going to be an interest rate risk for people who are going to borrow money in, in the future that could pay. Say you want to buy a house in the future that's going to mean higher uh, mortgage interest rates. It can mean higher credit card interest rates. It could mean uh, higher student loan costs. So there, there is a risk. Now, if you own bonds and interest rates increase, the value of your bonds decrease because the new bonds are going to come out bright, shiny, and new, paying 8% interest, and your bonds only paying 6% interest. It's not as valuable. It's going to decrease in its price. Uh, stocks typically don't react as quickly or as, as directly correlated as bonds do to interest rate changes. But if interest rates do go up, it generally slows the economy as people have less money to purchase things because they're paying more interest. And that can have an effect on reducing the stock prices. So we unanimously, we all like it when interest rates go down, but we don't like it when they go up. And that's the risk. But if you don't initially increase interest rates, you have a much bigger risk of inflation. So if interest rates are kept at very low percentages and uh, people are buying more and more things, then inflation can develop as more money is chasing fewer goods. And inflation is a much greater um, wealth stealer than interest rates. So we, must, we, must, we prefer, and we've made the decision in the past, to have higher interest rates and lower inflation. And when the Fed, when we had really high interest rates in the United States in the late 70s, Paul Volcker of the Federal Reserve jacked up interest rates to double digit, very high percentages to kill the economy, to kill the inflation. Because it was more important to have lower or stable inflation than a growing economy. You know, so when the Federal Reserve sees that the economy is getting overheated, they'll quickly increase the interest rates to keep, it, uh, to keep inflation at bay. 
So we know, I might as well talk about inflation risk now. Inflation risk is, you know, just that. You know, you want to buy something and now it's more expensive. You want to take that trip or buy that loaf of bread or buy that movie ticket or buy a college tuition. Inflation is making it more expensive. So if you're a company, say you're an airline and oil prices go up greatly, now that's going to affect your profits. So inflation is going to affect the cost of doing business, which means it's going to eat into your profits, which means you're going to have to raise prices to consumers, and that means you may sell less because consumers only have so much money. Now, market risk uh, is a different, kind of a different thing. Market risk is, think of the market like a tide. When we have a bull market or a bubble, like we, we might have now, all stocks are rising as the tide of the stock market. The S&P in the, at the Dow hits all new highs. So all stocks are rising with this tide. So when you say, well, what about this stock? It went down 10%. Well, I say that stock would have went down 20% if it wasn't for this rising tide of interest in the stock market right now. So it sort of helps all stocks, like all boats, to float higher. But when the stock market goes down in a bear market, all stocks are going to feel a reduction in their possible increases in prices because the market, you know, money flows in and flows out of the market due to investor sentiment. And investors feel it's a bear market, companies are losing money, they're going to pull their money from the stock market, and stocks are all going to go down. And you really can't, how do you, uh, diversification won't help you too much in a stock market. If you have, even if you have every different industry covered, if all if the stock market in total is going down, your portfolio is going to go down. Uh, that's why sometimes if you want to temper your investments with not just stocks but have some bonds in there and then but they're also affected by inflation but then maybe you have some real estate and some other tangibles that aren't like gold and real estate they could be that could help in that area okay switching on now though interest rate market risk and inflation risk are, are risks that you can't really escape by having a well diversified portfolio they're going to affect all those assets but business risk is um, different. So we have business and financial risk. They sound like the same thing, right? But they're not. Business risk is tied directly to the business. So if you have a business and you know, having a chain of soft-served frozen yogurt like Red Mango, there, there are more, from what I can see in this area, there are more Red Mangoes closing than there are opening because the business is failing. Because for a lot of families, $50 for ice cream or soft serve ice cream with toppings is just not realistic. It's not, there's so much better things you could do for $50. You know, because if, if you have a family of four or five come in, they get rather large frozen yogurt with toppings, easily can come to $10 a person. And that's just too much. So the business is really, that business caters a lot to families and children because children like to go out to get ice cream and, you know, or parties and things like that. So the business, there's more business risk because they feel like that model can't sustain a, a large number of competitors all trying to sell the same thing. You know, um, now they can fix that if they, if they diversify their business and Red Mango try to diversify it into, um, juices and uh, uh, vegetable juices and smoothies and different things besides soft serve ice cream or frozen yogurt or whatever they're pretending it is. Uh, now, financial risk is different. Financial risk is more about the finances of the company. So you could have a company, do you know this company Boston Market? Okay, it used to be called Boston Chicken when it first came out. Boston Chicken was the Shake Shack of the 1990s. So you know how Shake Shack came out recently and it went up, we talked about this in class, it went up a lot in value and people are all like, yay, Shake Shack, and I want my shake and my burger, and I love it. Same thing about Boston Chicken in the 90s. Boston Chicken came out, it was the same phenomenon, the stock price went crazy, everybody loved it, um, and they had a great business. Their business was doing really well, and they, their concept was, we're not fast food, we're more like home-cooked food that you, know, you could get at, at fast pace. And people like that concept. And they're like, yeah, I'm tired of burgers and fries. Give me some roasted chicken and, and some you know, Thanksgiving style sides. And the business was booming and they were opening a lot of locations very fast. The problem was they were too aggressive on their financing. And they borrowed too much money too quickly at too high of an interest rate. And then when the business slowed a little bit, they weren't able to 
meet their financial obligations, and that's financial risk. If a business can't pay its interest, then it's insolvent. But it could still be a good business. So what happened? Boston Market still, it would turn into Boston Market, but that was after. What happened is McDonald's bought them. And they said, okay, you're in bankruptcy, but it's still a good business, we're gonna buy it and run it. And we know how to run fast food companies and we have plenty of financing, our financing's not a problem, so we can restructure all your debt, buy your business and, and run it. And if actually, actually at one point McDonald's was thinking to turn a lot of those into McDonald's locations, but they left it as Boston Market. And they, they changed it from Boston Chicken to Boston Market to diversify the business a little bit, make the business a little stronger. So it's not just chicken, it's also meatloaf and sandwiches or pork or whatever else they serve, I don't know. I don't go there. Um, now, so that's financial risk. It, it can be tied to business, but it's typically, it's sort of like, remember a hostess went bankrupt, but then people bought the assets of hostess and now they're making Twinkies again. Because Twinkies and um, Ringdings, I think, and those are big business. That makes money, it's a good business. It's just that the company became very insolvent, so they went bankrupt, but someone still bought the assets because Twinkies are a money maker. So the business risk was low, but the financial risk was high, so they went bankrupt and someone bought the business because it's still good business. So that's the difference between the two. A lot of people get confused. Liquidity risk is the ability to convert your investment to cash. So stocks have a low liquidity risk because you can cash out and get your cash pretty quickly same day. Real estate is much longer. It may take months or years, depending. So liquidity is a risk. How quickly can you convert your asset back into cash? Uh, exchange rate risk, we talked about exchange rates already, so we know this. And country risk, there's political risk. If you invest in a foreign country that doesn't have a stable government or doesn't have a certain level of political freedoms or stability, that could be risky for your business. If you invest in a country that has a history of nationalizing industries, you know, there's a, you know, countries like Cuba and Mexico uh, and, and many other countries in Iran where they had international corporations come in and make their oil industry. And then the government just turned around and said, you know what, that's ours now. We're gonna put a Mexico sticker on that rig and it's ours now, we own it. Get out. So then the, the oil company's like, all right, what are we gonna do, you know? And then, but what happens is, these state-run companies can't efficiently run their oil industries, so they eventually, at some point, invite back these companies to fix everything up, and these companies get smarter and they make better deals, but it's just a cost of doing business. So it's country risk, especially if you're, if you're dealing, you know, there were a lot of foreign com uh, companies who had investments in Libya, and then that country just nationalized everything, and then recently it's changing back to these companies coming back and reinvesting in it. But they're gonna, they're gonna you know, they're taking a risk because that country could easily turn around again and say, okay, we're nationalizing everything after they updated everything. So you see, these are risks. We can move these risks into two um, types of categories. We have systematic, which are general risks, and that was like your interest rate or market or inflation risks. These are risks you just can't escape from. They're gonna affect everything. But then there's the non-systematic or more specific risks, sometimes called diversifiable risks, and these risks are, you, are pretty much more uni uniquely involved to one company. So back here, when we're talking about business risk, financial risk, liquidity, um, well, those are actually two best examples, business and financial risk. Those are specifically uh, tied to companies. So having more than one company in your portfolio helps to eliminate these types of risks. But total risk would be your general risk and your, and your uh, specific risk together, or your systematic and non-systematic, or sometimes called diversifiable and non-diversifiable risks. Together, that's your total risk. So you have your, your environmental risks that cover, that can affect everything, and then you have your localized risks that specifically affect one company. And another type of risk that's non-systematic or specific could be an event risk. An event risk could be sort of like, in Japan, there is this earthquake and then a tsunami that devastated a bunch of businesses. So if your business headquarters was located and that tsunami came and wiped out your business headquarters, that's an event risk, something that you couldn't plan for, but as an investor, you could diversify by owning 50 companies, so that way only one of the 50 companies were affected by that event. You know, that's, these are just building a case for being more diversified. Okay, 
So let's go back to measuring risk. And um, so risk, of course, is the chance that you may not get the outcome or the return that you really want. So we can use standard deviation uh, as a measured deviation of returns from the mean as a way of giving us a, a predictability or a percentage chance of occurrence of returns. And again, we're going to cover this in detail in class. But this is, this is the basic standard deviation formula that we're going to use, but we're going to apply it to investments. So we're going to look at investments and their returns, and we're going to make a more predictable, get a more predictable idea of what the deviation in returns are. So for example, if there's a small deviation of 3%, means that on, say, both stocks, two stocks have an average return of 10%. But one stock has a deviation of 3%. We'll say it's you know two deviations, so it's greater than 90% chance that next year you're going to get either 13 or 7% return. Now another stock has a deviation of 6%, two standard deviations of 6%. I mean one standard deviation would be 3%. We're going to go two standard deviations, so it's like a 95% chance it's going to occur within that deviation. So that 10% return is either going to be 16 or 4% return. So which is riskier, the one with the larger deviation? So we're going to apply this to stocks uh, in, our, in our class handout to kind of examine this a little bit more closely. But it's using statistics to help us to get a better idea of the risks involved in investing, in investing in uh, uh, portfolio stocks and you know, investing in looking at stocks return over many years compared to another stocks return over many years and getting a better idea of the risks involved in, in the consistency of the returns. Okay. So let's talk about risk premiums. So additional return that you can earn for um, expected or additional risks that may occur. So there's e uh, equity risk premium, which is the difference between um, stock and a risk-free rate. So the risk-free rate is like a treasury bill. Say a 10-year treasury bill returns 2%. That's risk-free. I can get that no problem, no risk. I can get a 2% return easy. So here I would want to look at whatever my stock return is minus that 2% would really be my equity premium. So 2% is the starting point. So if I had a total stock return of 10%, really the equity premium is 8% because that 2% I could easily got on my own. So I'm not going to count that as part of my risk. Um, the bond horizon premium is the difference between the long and short term government securities. So here we'd look at if we have a 10 year treasury at 2% interest and a 30 year treasury at 3% interest, we'd say that the risk difference between the 10 and 30 is only 1%. But, but let's put this risk in perspective what we're talking about. In 10 years, you'll be paid your money back in one bond. In the other bond, it'll take 30 years for your money to be paid back to you. So if, if, if he lent you money, and he said, you know, um, he lent, uh, actually, you borrowed money from these two guys, and you promised to pay him back in 10 years, but you promised to pay him back in 30 years. Who has the less riskier promise? The 10 years, less riskier, because, you know, less things can happen in the 10 year period than the 30 year period. So that's sort of what we're talking about with bonds. Um, so there's this risk premium, and that's really any. Any, any rate above the risk-free rate. So sometimes we like to calculate the equity risk premium, so we have a formula for that. And we also have a bond horizon premium formula. Uh, again, these aren't mathematically complicated formulas, but they're sort of expressing a way to calculate what these percentages are. Okay, so let's talk about the risk return record. So since 1920, the Cumulative Wealth Index shows stock returns uh, dominated over bond returns. So in this 90 year period or so, stocks did better than bonds. Um, however, stock, the standard deviations for stocks were higher. So this tells us that stocks have better returns, but they're riskier returns. Mm -hmm. In some years, we make 30% returns. Some years, we lose 20% on the stocks. So there's a bigger uh, dispersion of returns on stocks, which we already, you guys already know, than bonds. Bonds are a little bit more consistent. Um, so the, average, the annual geometric mean for the S&P 500 um, is 10.3% with a standard deviation of 19.7%, I guess over this 90 year period. So a 10% return, you know, if it was the 90s, it'd be a 20% return plus. If it was the 2000s, it would be a 0% return. 
So the decade of the 90s, I think we get like a 20% return on average. The decade of the 2000s, from 2000 to 2010, I think we have like a 0% return in equities. But over the long term, it averaged out to a 10% return. And actually before the big downturns of the 2000s, that was more standard at 12%. But the 2000s actually brought that down to 10. So, but, um, so that just gives you an idea that you know, if you're investing for retirement and you have 50 years, if you're, you know, say you're going to retire, you're 25 now, you're going to retire at 75, 50 years, or maybe you're 30 and you retire at 60, you have 30 years, whatever, it's still over that period, you'll have the best return with stocks than any other investment um, according to the, you know, this data. Okay. So, that's the end of this chapter, but you may want to look at some of these returns by decade, by every 20 year period. There is some research you could do and there's some reports that have been published that, that parcel out returns the stock market, not you know, in a 100 year period, every, 10, every decade the return, or every 25 years, or every 50 years. So it's interesting to look at how the returns of the stock market change over different increments. And I think generally the five year increment is a safe increment. Generally, there's usually, in a five-year increment, if there is a downturn within that, if you wait, um, in usually within two years, there's an equal upturn. So having your money in stocks for five years is probably the shortest duration you would want. You don't want to invest your money in stocks for one year. That's risky. But if you have a five-year time horizon, I think that's the shortest time horizon that you could use to invest in stocks to minimize the risk. A better horizon is 10 years, and even better is 20. That's why when you're, you're saving for your retirement and you're 20 years in, or maybe even 30 years in, then you start to look to move money out of stocks and into bonds because now you have to kind of reset it and say, well, I only have 10 years left or five years left. I don't want all my money in stocks because if there's a, a bear market, I could lose 40% of my stock value. So if you're, and that's what happened to a lot of people in 2008, 2009. They're getting ready to retire at 65 or at 62 and they have a million dollars in their retirement account all in stock and suddenly now it's 500,000. So they say, I guess I'm still working, I'm not gonna retire, but hopefully they kept their money in stocks and today, a few, five years later, they would be able to retire, more than five years later, but okay. So that's it for chapter six.